achieved. Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions, the final episode of my show for 2013. And before we head into 2014, we are going to wrap the year with one heck of an event as UFC 168 takes place on December 28th, featuring two title fights, including the rematch as former champion, we haven't said that in a long time, at least in the middleweight division, former champion Anderson the Spider Silva challenges the new middleweight champion Chris Weidman in an attempt to get his title back. Also, Misha Tate, who was the former Strikeforce Bantamweight champion, goes after the woman who took her title away and is now the current UFC champion, Ronda Rousey. I'll be giving you my five main card predictions for this event. All of my preliminary predictions will be available at kamikazeoverdrive.net. Also, my bet, I'm coming up a 7-4 UFC on Fox uh, 9 event, and my bet packs are turning the corner. My number one play was Demetrius Johnson. He cashed in. Uriah Faber is also one of my big plays. He cashed in as well. I had Faber by submission, which was a big one. And I also was an advocate of the Nick Lentz, uh, Chad Mendes fight going the distance, which paid out as well quite nicely. Uh, the bet packs will be available for 10 bucks. Let's hopefully finish the year on a strong uh, note. You know, consider investing if you want to make some cash this event. Because again, I feel like I'm turning the corner here. I really like all of my main card predictions for this fight. And uh, although there, you know, there's some interesting odds out there, I'll do my best to be produce some profit. Uh, nonetheless, thank you very much to all of my sponsors. I never give you enough props anymore. But all of the links are available, like MMA Crips. All of the links are available on my website. And uh, as always, thank you very much for tuning in. Let's get to the first prediction. We start this card off in the UFC's featherweight division as the number 6 ranked featherweight Dustin the Diamond Poirier, 14-3-0, takes on Diego D.B. Brandao, 22-8. No, it's a big fight for Brandao. He's getting his opportunity. He's a former Ultimate Fighter winner and getting an opportunity to step up in competition. These are two very exciting fighters, at least on the main card. This is really a candidate for fight of the night. Again, Anderson Silva, Chris Wyman could steal that, but I really think these guys have a great opportunity. Now, Poirier is coming off a massive upset, which further solidified his top 10 status, upsetting Eric Koch. Well, Brandao, he's 4-1 in the UFC with pretty, pretty solid wins over Dennis Bermudez, Pablo Garza, and Daniel Pineda. And, you know, he really wants his opportunity to take his spot in the top 10. Now, Dustin's a BJJ brown belt. Six wins by submission, including some in the UFC tapping out uh, Max Holloway, Jonathan Brookins, and Pablo Garza, all by Darce Choke, which is very impressive, and he really likes that maneuver. He's got some decent wrestling, good transitions on top, and he's much better when he's in top position and fighting off his back, and he needs to maintain that in this fight. Statistically, he averages about 1.55 takedowns uh, and a 32% completion clip. Uh, he really relies heavily on his wrestling when he gets in trouble on his feet, and he knows how to change gears, which can be very effective. But we did see him struggle to get his grappling game going against the Korean Zombie and against Cub Swanson. He was uh, submitted by the Zombie, and it, it was a back-and-forth fight on the ground, high-level action on the mat, which was very impressive, and Dustin just got the wrong end of it. Now, Diango Brandao is a BJJ black belt, five wins by submission. He also holds a submission win over Pablo Garza, and he also tapped out Dennis Bermudez. His wrestling number is far more impressive, 3.38 takedowns at 80%. He's a very strong wrestler. He's improved significantly over the last uh, couple of years. Eight takedowns against Daniel Pineda. He looked excellent on top of Pablo Garza in that fight. He's a very dangerous submission fighter. He's not that great off his back, especially as long as the fight goes longer, as we saw in the Darren Elkins bout, but he's still dangerous, at least early on. Now, Brandau, he's very dangerous on his feet. He has a variety of techniques. He has good power. He'll throw some solid combinations, really likes those elbows, good kicks, heavy leg kicks, and he'll mix in a jumping knee, which he used a number of times in his last bout. Uh, Poria, he's also very strong in the feet. We saw him drop uh, Eric Koch a couple of times, but he does get hit a lot. He takes some good shots. Jonathan Brookings, who's not a world-class striker, did tag him with some big shots. And we also saw uh, a couple other fighters earlier in Poirier's career land some good shots and force him to revert back to his grappling base. Now, statistically, Poirier holds a significant advantage in strikes landed per minute, 4.06 to 2.36 for uh, Brandau. Strikes absorbed per minute. Brandau actually takes more than he dishes out at 3.01 absorbed, which isn't something he really wants to do against a guy like Poirier. Now, both guys can fight at a very high pace, but it's Dustin Poirier that can maintain it over a full fight. Diego Brandau cannot. Brandau is 7-7 seven and seven in fights that go outside of the first round. That's a terrible winning percentage for a fighter fighting at this level. His gas tank is a major issue. We saw him gas brutally versus Darren Elkins after a dominant first round. He was exhausted after his first round against Daniel Pineda. He throws very stiff shots, and he, he throws too much power into his attacks, and that causes him to slow down. He still can be dangerous, but not nearly as uh, uh, on the same level. Uh, especially against a fresh opponent who can use his speed to avoid a lot of his shots and anticipate and see them coming. Mentally, he isn't a very tough fighter. Poirier, on the other hand, his mental toughness, I used to question it, but he's got significantly better after the 
KZ fight, after the Cub Swanson fight, after the Eric Koch fight. He's, you know, impressed me in that uh, facet. Uh, the first round is going to be dangerous for Poirier. He needs to be very careful and do a, you know, avoid getting tagged by Brando and falling behind and getting beaten up. Uh, but I expect the pace and grappling of the diamond will simply be too much for Diego. He'll wear him out, and my prediction is Dustin Poirier to defeat Diego Brandao by submission. Up next, we're in the UFC's lightweight division. It's the number 10-ranked Jim Miller, 22-4-0 with one no contest. Takes on 13-7-1 Fabricio Camoys in a fight that has a lot of people scratching their heads. Uh, looking at where these, the, the two makeups of these fighters, Camoys is 1-2-1 and one in the UFC. His only win coming over Tommy Hayden. He also had a draw with Cal Uno a couple years ago. Uh, he did fought and lose to Gleison Tebow outside of the UFC, and he also fought Anderson Silva very early in his career. Yes, that Anderson Silva, the man fighting in the main event tonight. Uh, Miller, on the other hand, is a top 10 ranked fighter. He's 11 and 3 with one no contest in his UFC career. His and he did lose to Pat Healy, even though it was overturned. He has wins over uh, Joe Lozon, Melvin Gillard, and Gleison Tiba. All very, very impressive wins and shows he where he belongs, where he currently is sitting in the top 10, just on the cusp at least. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, he's a solid lower end elite fighter against a guy fighting for his job who's barely established that he belongs at this level. For me, this is a fight that sets up Miller with another win, an opportunity to rebuild himself as a relevant fighter and moving back up and, and challenge some of those other fighters. Now, for Briso Kamoy, he's no slouch. He's a third degree BJJ black belt, seven wins by submission. He has decent grappling, and Miller in this fight cannot afford to give up position and, and be sloppy on the mat. We saw Kamoy catch Tommy Hayden after exchanges on the mat, and Hayden lost position and, and paid for it. Kamoy's average is 2.57 takedowns at 32%, while with 1.6 submissions per fight, which means he gets his opportunities to put end fights. He had five takedowns versus Calo Uno, and he had one each versus uh, Hayden, Pellegrino, and uh, his other fight is escaping me right now. Um, uh, Melvin Glard, sorry, that's who it was. He also was taken down in each of those fights. He's actually been taken down six times in four UFC fights, and he's been submitted three times. Uh, Tebow got him early in his career in the UFC, and Pelle before the, he came to the UFC, and Pellegrino got him in the UFC. So his wrestling is really not his strong suit. We saw he could not control Melvin Glard despite getting him you know, many opportunities to get him on the ground. He just could not control the position and, and take advantage of a guy who is known for having submission is issues. Now, uh, Jim Miller is a BJJ black belt, NCAA Division I wrestler. He's 12-1 and one's, one in fights ended by submission. Nate Diaz is that one. Plus, of course, as I mentioned before, Bam Bam Healy did put him to sleep in his last fight that was overturned into a no contest. He has recent submission wins were a very dangerous submission fighter in, in Charles Oliveira, and he also tapped out Melvin Gillard. His number is not bad, 1.97 takedowns at 46%. He will average 2.6 subs per fight, which means he's very aggressive on the mat. His takedown defense is a little questionable, 39%. Uh, he's, he had bigger takedown numbers earlier in his career. He relied on his wrestling more uh, you know, significantly. And he has been taking down a lot of late. Mark Bocek took him down four times, Gleison Tebow four times, Ben Henderson took him down seven times, and most recently Pat Healy put him on his back five times. So it's not like his defensive grappling is impenetrable. But all those guys are very good wrestlers, all better than Fabricio Camoys. Keep that in mind. Now, as I said, Miller will forego position to attempt a submission, and that has cost him in the past on a number of occasions, actually, most you know, most notably against Ben Henderson, where he was going for submissions, and Henderson kept defending and taking advantage of the position. Miller's striking is still improving, but he is dangerous. We saw him rock Lyson Tebow. He ran over Joe Lowe's on early in that fight, especially with those level trajectory elbows that really put a hurting on him. And I think he has a massive advantage on the feet against Camoys, who's still very green in the striking categories. Camoys has lost twice by TKO, once by retirement, early against Anderson Silva. You know, Miller needs to avoid giving up position to attempt submissions. Um, I expect to see him break down Kamoyes with his striking and his pace and using his wrestling, especially later in that fight. And my prediction is Jim Miller to make a statement and pick up a submission win over Fabricio Kamoyes. We head now to what I'm considering the meat and potatoes portion of the main card. The first two fights were interesting. Now we're into the really meaningful battles. Uh, we're in the heavyweight division for this bout. Is the number six ranked Josh, the Warmaster Barnett, 33-6-0, a former UFC heavyweight champion. Takes on the number five ranked Travis Hoppa Brown in a very interesting fight. The winner of this bout could get a title shot. At the very least, should get a number one contender's bout next time out. Physically, four-inch height advantage for Brown, same reach. And we'll see if that height advantage actually is a positive or a negative for Brown. We'll talk about that in a moment. The experience advantage, it goes to Josh Barnett, both in quality and quantity. Um, he's fought better competition. He's fought more competition. But Brown's certainly you know rising up the ranks uh, since joining the UFC as far as the fighters he's faced. Now, Brown on the feet, he has very good movement, um, or at least... A lot of movement, a lot of footwork. Fat. He's pretty fast for heavyweight on, or, on an orthodox striker. He's toned it down a little bit in his most recent fights, but it's still there. He's coming off a knockout win over Alistair Overeem. He has 11 wins by knockout in his career, including uh, stopping Stefan Strube and Gabriel, Gabriel Gonzaga in the UFC. 
He has a tendency to hold his hands low, and he's able to get away with it because of his speed and his movement, but it only takes his one shot at heavyweight. It actually might aid him here, as it could help him to defend some takedowns by Barnett if Barnett elects to shoot in. We'll see if that actually transpires. Now, we look at his fight with Over, and he got mauled along the cage by Alistair early in that bout. He really had no answer for him on the wall. He got busted up with some serious knees and punches and nearly finished. We saw him struggle with Czech Congo in a similar position earlier in his career, and if it wasn't for Congo throwing a couple low blows and losing a point, he would have lost that bout. Brown's a BJJ purple belt. His grab Grappling is improving, but it's not on Barnett's level, and that's something that's very noteworthy in this matchup. Barnett is danger is a dangerous, very aggressive catch wrestling fighter. He's eight and zero in fights ended by sub eighteen and zero in fights ended by submission, which is an impressive run considering some of the guys he has faced. He has excellent takedowns, good throws, can work very well from the clinch. He likes to end his takedowns in side position, which sets him up to attack and be aggressive. Uh, he'll work to mount, looks for submissions, use a lot of ground and pound to really open up opportunities. His last three uh, wins have all come by side choke, or last three submission wins all by side choke or arm triangle, depending on what terminology you want to use. He gets that top mount again, ground and pound, breaks his opponent down, and sets up that submission. He is he showed excellent clinch work against uh, Frank Mir. He hits very hard. He was very aggressive from the position, landing a lot of elbows, knees, used the tie clinch effectively, and eventually put Frank away. Now, for me, with Barnett being the shorter fighter, that's going to allow him to control Brown along the wall, get that lower center of gravity, get underneath, establish the position and Brown's gonna have a lot of trouble getting you know getting down and getting that power generated against a lower uh, fighter which you know Barnett's usually not in that case he is a very big man Barnett style if the fight goes deep will test Brown's cardio we've known him to slow down a little bit and Bar Barnett when he's at the top of his game can, can can go he'll slow down too but not the way Brown does Brown he looked better uh, against Overeem when, he, when there was space, but not nearly as effective when he got smothered and close along the cage. That's what I expect here. Barnett only has one loss since 2006, and that was against Daniel Cormier, a far superior grappler. Brown is not in that category. Uh, we saw one, a one-legged Travis Brown get TKO by uh, Bigfoot Silva in close. He got shut down with some big shots. I know, you know, it's a question because of the one leg. I think he'll be in trouble here again. Travis or Josh Barnett, I expect he'll keep his back on the wall and on the cage uh, and on the floor. Sorry. Bust him up, beat him up, and my prediction is Josh Barnett to defeat Travis Brown by submission. We move now to the co-main event of the night as the UFC's ba Women's Bantamweight Championship will be on the line as the champion, Rowdy Ronda Rousey, 7-0 and undefeated, takes on the number two ranked fighter in the division, Misha Cupcake Tate, 13-4-0, and former Strike Force uh, middleweight or sorry, women's bantamweight champion. I already have the main event on my mind. Now we've it's been there's 21 months have passed since Rousey originally took the belt from uh, Tate back in Strike Force. Whether it's the belt or not, it, you can see the connection there. Tate, uh, he she came out swimming in the, or swinging in that bout. She landed a few good shots and went for a takedown. And Rous, Rousey countered her very easily and used a good you know her judo background and judo stylings to reverse her and, and land in top position. Uh, we saw Rousey use a quick armbar attempt. It looked pretty bad, but Tate showed a lot of guts, got her way out of it, and got you know, back to a better spot, which was impressive considering the number of people Rousey had ran over with that same maneuver. Uh, Tate ended up taking her down, took her back, but couldn't hold her there, but that's something that's noteworthy. Uh, we saw the scramble. Rousey got out, led to a trip takedown for Ronda, then a throw. We saw great transitions from Ronda, the typical float over, pitter-patter, forced, forced Tate to expose her arm, and then the armbar came and eventually the finish. Uh, and that's what we know, Rouse, you know Ronda Rousey, what she's all about. On the feet is where one of the areas that Tate could have some success. Ronda leaves her chin up when she strikes, and she's not nearly as dominant a force on the feet, and she's forced to compete there. The, it's, the fight's winnable for Misha Tate, as far as I'm concerned there. The key is keeping it in that position. Tate isn't a world-class striker either, and that's something to keep, keep in mind. And she seems to revert back to her wrestling, as we saw in the first fight. We'll see if she makes the same mistake here. Additionally, back mount could be a key to Misha Tate's success. She had uh, a lot of, you know, had some early success against Rousey because she was able to get in that position. We also saw Liz Kermouche get in that position and nearly crush Ronda's face and, you know, shock the world with an upset in the very first women's uh, title fight uh, in the UFC. Tate, he, she's very good wrestling and she's submission savvy, but the judo of Rousey is so good it really deflected what Tate had to offer on the mat. Um, the most part is. Uh, Will the you know Ronda Rousey being a one trick pony is that going to eventually catch up with her? Is it this fight? I don't know. We'll have you know. I don't think so. Uh, Tate really hasn't looked good for me since she beat Marlos Kunin back in 2011. It's actually interesting. Ronda Rousey basically pointed that out. We saw after she beat Kunin, she lost the title to Rousey. She got destroyed by Julie Kedzie before rallying for a submission win, and then got the tar beat out of her by Kat Zagano, and then walked into this fight when Zagano went down with an, with an injury. Uh, keep in mind, Tate wanted a break from MMA, and then when the UFC came along, she kind of got back into it, but it tells me her mentally she's not all there. 
Uh, for Rousey, she hasn't fought since February. She's been off for a little break. So has Misha Tate, at least. Uh, but Ronda Rousey has, a, has had a longer layoff. Big question is, what improvements has she made? Has she, she have more subs? Is her striking better? We'll see if that plays out here. Tate has to either keep this fight in a standing position, or as I said, get Ronda's back, which is a major risk because that puts her right on the ground and puts her on the wrong end of things. She also needs to test Ronda's cardio. If she can drag the fight into later stages, will that wear Ronda out and make her less effective? We haven't seen Ronda go that far and about yet. I don't think she's gone into the first round. Rousey's grappling has looked superior to Tate's in all pretty much all facets. That's one thing I will say. And I really don't think anything's changed. If anything, Ronda Rousey's probably got better. Misha Tate's either stayed the same or regressed a little bit. My prediction is Ronda Rousey most likely by arm bar to su submit Misha Tate and maintain her status as the top-ranked champion UFC 135-pound women's fighter. We move now to the UFC 168 main event and the final UFC event of 2013 as the newly crowned UFC middleweight champion Chris, we Chris the All-American Weidman 10-0 undefeated takes on the number one contender and former champion, Anderson the Spider Silva, 33-5-0. Oh. Now, five months have passed since these guys last fought. They haven't fought anybody else, so they've been getting ready for this rematch. I originally picked Weidman to win the title, and he did successfully. Weidman was, is considered, was considered the future of the division. Many were unsure if he was ready for the fight. Um, some people say yes, he proved he was. Other people say no, still it's not 100% yet. Because, in my opinion, Silva's clowning clearly cost him that bout. There's no question about it. Yes, he does it all the time. He gets away with it. I think it costs him. I think you're stupid to consider any other way as far as that, you know, acting in the cage, you know, took the title from around Silva's waist when Chris Weidman knocked him out. Weidman in that fight scored an early takedown, which was very impressive. He landed some very good shots on the ground. He advanced his position. He had a heel hook attempt, which is something that Silva's been susceptible, uh, you know, in his distant past. Uh, but Silva defended very nicely, got out of the heel hook attempt, got up. Weidman fought with his hands down in that bout. He seemed a little out of it on the feet. As far as I was concerned, he seemed a little bit off. He was standing with Silva. His mouth was open. He was throwing a lot of single attacks. Anderson was attacking, but he didn't press the action. Uh, Silva stuffed an early second round takedown attempt, but didn't do a lot until the eventual flurry that ended the fight. Uh, for me, Weidman showed he could take him down and do damage, but Silva showed he could get up from those fight uh, takedowns, defend takedown attempts as well, and that's interesting on both accounts. Weidman has significant power. We've seen that in that fight. We saw it against Mark Munoz. No question about that, and his sub abilities are fantastic. He's a very talented grappler, and he's really his wrestling and submission combination is a combination threat that's very scary. If he can stay on top, he could finish this fight or control his way to a decision. We'll see if that transpires. Now, Weidman looked like he was succumbing to the aura of Silva a little bit in that fight. As I said, his mouth was open. He had those hands down. He was like, you know, he was throwing a lot of single sh shots. He wasn't shooting for takedowns, and you know, he really scored that knockout before Silva could take advantage of Weidman starting to, to you know, shut down at least mentally. Weidman's gas tank is a question mark. Seven of his ten fights have ended inside the first half of the fight. He has three decisions. He did gas against Damian Maya, but again, he took that fight on short notice. Either way, still we haven't seen the guy show up full fight where he's looked fantastic start to finish. Uh, Weidman has all the skills and he's added some confidence with that win over Anderson Silva. He's taken away a little bit of that machismo or whatever you want to call it, Anderson Silva brings in because Weidman can say I've beaten you. Um, Silva in that fight was starting to open up and he was getting the better of the striking as far as I'm concerned until he got caught. He needs to focus and that's a priority here. The question is will he? And that's, like, that's a big question. Is he too proud to admit through his actions that he made a mistake in the first fight by coming out and not clowning and not doing those things that cost him? Or is he too proud to lose a fight again? And you know, not that he really had the choice to lose that fight, but, you know, he only has the choice to fight and go out there and show what he's capable of. Silva, this is the first time he's had to rebound from a defeat since 2006, and he's never had to do it in the UFC. And this is his first knockout defeat, and that's a major question as well. Is his chin cracked as a result? You know, taking that shot, Silva had a vaunted, unbelievable chin until he gets knocked out. Is it going to impact his performance? Is he going to be a little slow on the trigger? Is his age catch, catching up to him finally? Um... Another big question, is he motivated, or is a payday in the pressure of the UFC the only reason he's here? He did say he was done, and Lito Machida made the same, said that you know Anderson was done, and Dana forced him back into this position. Um, you know, Chris Weidman has all the tools to win this bout, but the way the fight was going after the initial takedown wasn't promising. If Anderson Silva focused, I think that fight was his to take. If Silva just fights, I think he wins this bout. I think he will fight. I think back to the Sun and Silva uh, 2 fight. He came out. He was very aggressive. He did get shut down, take down early, but he rebounded. He was no nonsense in that bout. He got after it. He won that bout. So my prediction is the total opposite of the first fight. My prediction is Anderson the Spider Silva to defeat Chris Weidman and take back his middleweight title. And I got Silva doing it by knockout. 
So those are my five main card predictions for the final UFC event of 2013. All of my preliminary breakdowns will be available at kamikazeoverdrive.net, so please check them out. And uh, the bet packs are also rolling. Josh Harper's predictions will be available at kamikazeoverdrive.net under the new moniker uh, Kid Kamikaze. He'll have his own page. Please consider them because he's doing fantastic. When I've been slumping of late, he's picked up the slack tremendously. So even if you don't want to follow my picks because you know I have been off a little bit, Please check out Josh's picks because they have been spot on. He's had a very good run of late. Um, for you and your family, I wish you the best in you know for uh, heading into 2014. And I will be back with some fantastic uh, fight predictions and a heck of a good year ahead of us in the year 2014. Uh, thanks as always for listening.